I want to begin by also thanking the Honourable Lady from Pontypridd for her sponsorship of this debate and for the excellent exposition of the challenges that are faced in terms of animal welfare as a result of COVID-19 at the beginning of this debate. Whilst in COVID-19 we face a situation unparalleled in our lifetimes with all the challenges it brought, with all its cost us in terms of the loss of loved ones, job opportunities, with all its disruption, we know that there is no situation which will diminish the importance of animal welfare in the eyes of our constituents. The UK is indeed four nations of animal lovers. Animal welfare has been a mainstay in my inbox since 2015, whether it be about the cruel practice of puppy smuggling, the ivory trade, the fur trade, experimentation on animals, the wildlife trade, animal caging, trophy hunting. Indeed, animal cruelty of any type has, meant, has motivated my constituents to contact me in large numbers to express their concerns, and I'm sure every member present today would say pretty much the same. COVID-19 has thrown up challenges for animal welfare, as it's thrown up challenges in a whole range of areas. But I would like to begin by pointing out that for charities such as Dogs Trust, COVID-19 has put significant strain on its operations, and its rehoming centres have had to operate at a much reduced capacity. Indeed, all 20 of its rehoming centres were closed to the public, while staff continued to do all we could to safeguard the welfare of the dogs in their care. Rehoming has, been, has taken place during COVID-19, but it's been very challenging and has decreased last year by 88%. And the same is true of cats, according to Cat Protection. And this is deeply unfortunate when you consider that we know COVID has saw an increased demand for dogs with Google searches for buy a puppy increasing by 166% after the first lockdown was announced. And it's not surprising that more people wanted the companionship of a dog or a cat when they're forced to spend more time at home. But there is some concern, as we've heard, about when people return to something like a normal routine and they will find themselves, or if they find themselves out of work and on much tighter budgets, they may find they can no longer accommodate a pet in their lives as they once did. And it will be charities like Dogs Trust or Battersea or Blue Cross or Cat Protection, which will somehow take on these animals and offer them whatever home they can. But we can also expect that the so-called pandemic puppies are likely to be less socialised than if they were bought in normal times. Puppies acquired during lockdown with limited opportunities for socialising, social distancing, lack of exposure to other people and indeed lack of exposure to even traffic and everyday life has caused some concern to animal charities who may ultimately have to pick up the pieces of those pets who may be required to be rehomed. And we also know that having a dog or a cat can incur costs that may not have been considered at the outset. Indeed, Battersea estimates that 19% of new pet owners come to regret their decision to acquire a pet, mainly because of costs. And this demand for puppies during COVID has unfortunately also been exploited by those who engage in puppy smuggling. We know puppy smuggling causes great distress to puppies and is very damaging. Uh, my view is that this barbaric practice is so lucrative that nothing but the potential threat of significant custodial sentences for this crime can realistically hope to help mitigate this growing problem. And it's also worth considering the challenges people faced in terms of financing and accessing veterinary care, as we've heard during the pandemic. Whilst lockdown limited access to veterinary care, this means there's a backlog of neutering and vaccination courses for pets, which have been disrupted. But even when these normal services resume, we cannot assume that every dog owner, however well-intentioned, will be able to afford the cost of veterinary care for their pet, as perhaps they once did. Delaying or even not being able to afford access to treatment for pets could have real implications for pets' longer term and overall health. And as for cats, this is an especially significant issue since this could lead to much higher numbers of unwanted litters. The pressure on the charities who work hard who work hard to improve animal welfare, so my apologies, uh, uh, will be dealing with this fallout for years to come as the consequences are all too real. And the Cats Protection Pause Protect Service, which su supports survivors of domestic abuse and their cats, has found that simply it could not cope with all the referrals it had for the service during 2020. 
And yet we know, as we've heard, that the link between domestic abuse and animal abuse is well established. Indeed, pet cats and dogs are at high risk in abusive households as perpetrators direct their anger at pets and use them to, manip to manipulate their victims. It's clear that just as animal welfare charities have found their services in demand more than ever, it has also found that the opportunities for traditional fundraising have all but disappeared and its income stream very seriously curtailed. Charity shops closed and for cat protection, this has meant the loss of four million pounds in the first four months of shop closures in 2020. And this is income that can never be recovered as all fundraising adventure challenges were canceled as well. And there were fewer and fewer opportunities for cat adoption and the fees derived from this. We're all concerned about the negative impacts on animal welfare as a result of COVID-19. So it seems today is a good day to highlight to the minister what can be done about it. For a start, to help animal welfare charities, which we know will be under severe strain in the months and years following lockdown as they deal with animal, crisis, animal welfare crisis, and the fallout from COVID looks all too set to continue. So it really is important that the government works with animal welfare charities to see how it can better support the work they currently do and all the additional work the sector will face as we return to some kind of normality. And of course, underpinning all this is the need to ensure that in our trade deals, that the high standards we all wish to see are a feature. Now, we in the SNP fought during the passage of the Agriculture Bill and the Trade Bill to ensure that imported foods had to match our high animal welfare and safety standards in domestic produce, to ensure that our farmers were not undercut with low quality, low grade animal welfare regulations. But instead, now and into the future, foreign traders, which have lower animal welfare standards and as a consequence, lower costs, may have a competitive advantage over our own farmers. A race to the bottom does not promote high standards of animal welfare that we all want to see. And of course, for the sake of the food that we eat. Surely we cannot have forgotten the risks posed by compromising on animal welfare and the damage to our, our foods and mitigating against diseases such as foot and mouth disease and swine flu. So it's really important that the government lobbies through international bodies to pressure countries to upgrade their animal welfare regulations to avoid the potential of disease outbreaks crippling our domestic standards in trade deals. From 2015, since I was elected to this place, I have been calling for tougher penalties for animal cruelty. Now, the Scottish Government agreed and has enshrined tougher penalties for animal cruelty into law with a maximum five year sentence and unlimited fines. And it really is time for the UK government to get this on the statute books as well, as soon as possible, because it has fallen behind in that regard. COVID-19 has been hard on all of us, but the consequences on the animal welfare charitable sector has been devastating. We must do more to support the vital work undertaken by animal welfare charities, and I very much look forward to hearing from the Minister as to how she intends to do so. <laughs>